Hi there, I'm your host, John Iverson. I'm joined, as usual, by Marcella Monroe, who is a principal at Macmillan Vantage, and Andrew Balfour, who is managing partner at Rubicon Strategies. Hi, guys. Hey. How are you? I'd like to kick off talking about the visceral anger that I've uh, been hearing from uh, what you might call blue liberals or, or business liberals um, as a result of the cabinet shuffle. And one guy, a senior guy, accused his colleagues of vandalising the economy and called Justin Trudeau Canada's first NDP Prime Minister. Yet, as we all know, at one time, uh, business liberals thrived and even predominated in, uh, in John Cretier's government. It was Paul Martin in finance, John Manley at uh, industry, Anne McClellan at natural resources, and so on. I was uh, a, a former a, a guy we all know, Gene Lang, who was a former chief of staff in the Martin government, He'd written a piece about 18 months ago talking about the extinction of the business liberal um, and saying that in past liberal governments they've been a strong voice, even empathising with the business community and sometimes making the case for them at the cabinet table. I think, as a, you know, he was writing this 18 months ago and I think as a result of the cabinet shuffle, which we've just seen, where Stephen Gibbo, uh, an environmental activist, becomes the environment minister, and more centrist ministers like Jim Carr and Mark Garneau are shuffled out of cabinet, I think you could say that the the, uh, the business liberal is now extinct as a as a force in the Liberal Party, and I wonder whether it matters, Marcella. Well, as as, as someone quipped uh, after the cabinet shuffle, you know the, the best path to the Trudeau cabinet is through McGill or his wedding party, right? So that's that's more <laughs> in tune where I. Th- think these decisions are being made than any sort of analysis of the economy. Um, listen, I think it's fair to say that, that there isn't right now any of the blue liberal tinge in this cabinet, certainly not in the dominant way, as you've suggested there was in the past. And I do think it's a real challenge. Um, you know, we're coming to a very critical moment, as we know, with climate change and the need for some serious rethink of the economy post-COVID. And I feel like it's not so much to me having necessarily, you know, quote unquote, a suit at the table. Um, But it is, I think, having some people at the table who, you know, have a very sophisticated understanding of Canada's economy and the possible paths we have through the next 10 years. And I don't really see that represented here. Um, So again, I don't know that it has to be, quote unquote, someone from Bay Street that they're missing. Uh, But, you know, surely they could they could do with an economist or two, (laughs) one would think. Right. I, well, I want to come back to you and talk about, um, you know, the, the environment, climate change and, and what you saw in Alberta, because you were you were in a, an NDP government in Alberta that had to deal with these. But just firstly, Andrew, I mean, does it matter that, uh, uh, you know, presumably if you don't have that kind of mindset around the cabinet table, it becomes a more adversarial task when you have to deal with the business community, as they're going to have to do it, as they cap emissions in the oil patch? I think that some of this is overblown. I mean, and to Marcello's point that she just made, there is an economist at the table. Jean-Yves Duclos, now the health minister, and he's an economist. Um, and there are lots of lawyers around the cabinet table. Um, I think the other thing to look at is that Justin Trudeau became leader of this party and at no point in time has he ever hidden that they were going to do things differently and he's never hidden what his priorities were going to be and a lot of those priorities are not aligned with what you're calling the business liberal um with that said the industry minister or i said or whatever we want to call it these days uh minister champagne is certainly a business liberal he's a very accomplished person it's not they're not extinct it's just not the way it they're endangered. Just, the way, just not the way it used not to be. Not unlike our polar well, bears. I mean, you're putting, you're putting, you're trying to put lipstick on this pig. I'm That's sorry, not what I'm saying. What I'm saying you know, is that you are. You're. You're. You, this is a, 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 a national interest uh, issue to me. The, the idea of jobs and okay. growth. And I saw Christian Freeland actually try to. to uh, uh, make nice with the Chamber of Commerce yesterday when she said jo- jobs and growth are her, are her number one priority. I, I, I suspect she's getting told by finance that we can't sell our, our bonds internationally at the moment. You've got to start patching up the relationship with well, business. Well, just one quick thing on that is that um, the inevitability of them looking at the you know 
federal balance sheet, let's call it that, and recognizing that there is still a need for the energy. The energy sector is not getting shut down, which is what a lot of people are trying to say. Um, and growth and jobs are going to still, you know, 20 percent of our economy is focused around that. People, maybe if what you're saying is true, which I don't necessarily agree with, people who sit around the cabinet table are going to be quickly reminded that we're not shutting down the energy sector. Okay, so Marcello, going back to Gibo, who he was asked if um, uh, a cap on emissions, which is what he's going to bring in, means no more projects. And he said, well, we don't have any uh, control over production. We just control emissions. But th clearly that's being too cute by half. Uh, if you cut emissions, then it's going to have an impact on production. It's going to have an impact on exports. It's going to have an impact on the standard of living of Canadians, none of which I suspect he cares too much about. Uh, but you were part of a government that, that faced this precise uh, problem with uh, Rachel Notley's government. How did you approach it? Was it, much, was it, was it um, imposed from above or was there dialogue? So look, I, first of all, I would say Perrin Beattie and the Chamber didn't do themselves any favours and uh, you know, releasing pre-cabinet this list of tax relief they wanted. That shouldn't be the conversation right now, in my view. But, but to your point, yeah, we, look, we, we put a cap on emissions, right? So there is some precedence for this. But I think the people of Alberta would argue that it was one thing to be annoyed when we did it. It's another thing for a national government to do it. Because what they're really saying is, look, Alberta, British Columbia, to some degree, Saskatchewan, um, you've got to change your policies to fit now our cap on emissions. So that's the first challenge is it's a provincial responsibility, natural resources, and they're, they're trying to direct from very far above. But the second thing I would say, it's a, you know, it's, I, I feel the pain of the people in the patch today because, listen, when we came into office, one of the things we were acutely aware of is two things. One, you know, we know we're going to need our oil and gas supplies for, for decades to come. Um, that's just a, but there's an opportunity there too, is the second part. And so the question with this transition is something we'll hear a lot about during COP is what are you doing to fund the kind of technology that we need to, to deal with some of these serious issues? Because I really believe it's going to be some of those engineers, uh, maybe in Alberta, uh, but certainly in the world that work in oil and gas that are going to come up with some of the technological solutions. And I think appointing Mr. Gabo on, on day one, it's kind of a signal that we maybe don't even want to have that conversation, which is which is which is right. very difficult. You know, if, if we're just going to say no to things like you know net zero natural gas power production, um, while a lot of us are plugging a lot more things in, including you know the, the revolution going on now with electric vehicles, then on day one that that's going to be a pretty big challenge for this government. And I think a better approach would be the one we tried to take. You know, and people will judge us whether we were all successful or not. But we really approached it by saying we know we've got to use the revenue and the monies that come from oil and gas not to shut down the industry, but to make sure that we're supporting them in this technological revolution that's going on. And I don't think I have any confidence that this minister will want to be a part of that conversation. Right. Uh, did, did your government uh, differentiate between... Uh oil and natural gas. I mean, natural gas emits around half of the, uh, once, once it's combusted, it's about half the emissions of, of oil, and, oil and coal. Uh, he was asked that question yesterday. He said, no, fossil fuels, fossil fuel, we're going to uh, shut all emissions down. Right. Well, we, I mean, we did to the extent that we said, listen, while we're trying to transition from coal to a different electricity supply, natural gas has to be part of that equation. <laughs> uh, natural gas, which, you know, Alberta has an abund great abundance, as just British Columbia. Uh, and so why wouldn't that be a good transition fuel, right? It might be 20 or 30 years before we can fully transition to renewables. Uh, but why wouldn't we take advantage of natural gas? The other thing I would say is, it's, it, you know, there's, <laughs> is, is carbon the problem? Yeah, carbon's the problem. Um, but, you know, there's different kinds of production in this country. There's different oil and gas companies in this country that are spending millions, in some cases billions of dollars, figuring out how to get you know get the oil out of the ground or the or the gas out of the ground with the lowest possible and in some cases they're trying to head towards net zero carbon emissions um, and I also think it's back to this age-old problem we have which we're very quick to point our fingers at the producers and no one really wants to and I this goes for environmentalists overall right it's very difficult though to talk to the consumers which are a bigger part of the problem right right Andrew um the exasperation I was hearing from, from caucus members, from former caucus members, uh, I'm sure is replicated in the electorate. And there must be uh, uh, 
blue liberal voters who are shaking their heads at some of the things that are going on. Do you think this creates a, an opportunity for the Conservative Party? I don't think it does because those blue liberals are not an Aaron O'Toole social conservative voter. They would prefer, in my opinion, to have the this liberal cabinet that they wish they were part of and they were shut out of, which is why they're complaining to you, um, to uh, then they're going to stick with the devil they know instead of having Aaron O'Toole and his gang run the country. It's pretty straightforward. Or they just stay home next time and not give you any checks anymore. <laughs> or, or they stay home, for sure, but I don't picture them going and voting. I, I think that's where you'll first see it, is, is the... Out, um, yes is donations. No, donations. I mean, uh, we saw that in um, when the Liberals tried to bring in the small business tax. That and all the, well. you know, the dentists and lawyers and, and doctors decided not to attend Laurier Club events. I suspect the Laurier Club may be the, uh, the biggest, take the biggest hit. Um, but just turning from, we've been, we've been talking about climate change. Obviously, Justin Trudeau's taken off this morning, heading for G20 in Rome, heading first to The Hague, for discussions with the with the Dutch Prime Minister, then to the, to Rome for the G20, and then to Glasgow, the dear dear green place as it's known, which is kind of ironic given it's wet and grey most of the time, <laughs> but um, that is where the the COP26 is taking place, and I'm not sure what to expect from that. I mean, we know the government is has already committed to net zero. We know the government is committed to 45 uh, percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Is anybody expecting to see some nuts and bolts on how we're going to get there, Marcella? Well, again, I feel like the, the government with the ministerial announcement this week kind of has put themselves in a corner. So, you know, I expect we will see, for example, and they've already alluded to this and been talking about it, like an agreement on methane reductions. We know that methane is far more deadly than CO2. Um, we also know there are some pretty good technological solutions to reducing the methane from oil and gas production. So again, the question to me comes back to, um, if you're really committed to that, then what you should be doing is funding those technologies, the ones we know work immediately, and ensuring that not just Canada, but other countries that are major oil and gas producers are employing those technologies. It might even mean funding places you know, like Nigeria that might not be able to afford the tech, or, or maybe their government and the companies there need some more help in implementing it. Um, so I would hope they would come to some sort of agreement on methane. As a, as a prime example, um, but you know we are we know that this climate change issue is is quite you know quite deadly serious in, in a very authentic way we saw it this summer, and so we've been seeing that governments behind the scenes have been jockeying and again I think it's it would be great to think Canada can be a leader not just in saying we need to work towards transition to but putting some money on the table to do so but it's kind of problematic if we're, we're our opening gambit is to kind of say look we're looking at shutting down our oil and gas industry which is what i feel like we're going in with right right and, and andrew i mean we saw seen already that india has said uh, we're a victim of climate change not a contributor towards it uh that kind of tempers my optimism what about you i when i saw that i like actually laughed out loud um that, that's just cannot be true. Well, it's not funny. It's true. No, but they're, it's kind of I true, mean, though. I mean, there's like, they're, they're trying they're to electrify the country. There's people that literally don't even have electricity still. No, no. I, sorry. I guess what I'm saying is I thought it was hilarious that they're trying to say that they aren't uh, like a polluter or an emitter. Like, it's like, okay, you're a couple of billion people. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. You're not out of this yet. But just quickly, I just want to, yeah. on just resource development in this country, um, while we might be trying to put a cap on this, and I don't know whether the amount of emissions that come out of so, you know, a lithium mine or whatever it might be, but it seems that the government of Ontario is quite uh, intent upon developing the Ring of Fire, finally. We've been hearing about this for years, and that's going to involve a lot of federal EAs. So I don't think that there's a way to shut that down either. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, resource industry, 22% of our exports, 10% of our economy, uh, you can't just stop development, especially when your number two exporter is, is autos. And that is in crisis, too, because uh, we are not at the moment getting the big uh, battery cell manufacturing plants that uh, 
that are required to make that industry a, an anchor for future investment. So, so it's it's kind of troubled times, and um, my th- my hope at least is that the government uh, takes a little bit more of an enlightened view about generating wealth in this country. Well, we country. also just need to have an adult conversation about the fact that we do need to transition. Climate change is real. We do need to substantially reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but we also have a population that needs support. And so, you know, trying to, putting Mr. Goubeau there just kind of sends a signal that, you know, the environmentalists have won. It's a little bit like Perrin Beattie saying, we just need to cut all these taxes. Like, we need a, a more adult conversation if we're going to achieve the goals. This government has, has campaigned and been elected on the, the ticket of balancing the environment and the economy, and it seems to me that we've just uh, thrown away that balance and that they, that it's, it's all environment and no economy. Well, but it's not entirely true because at a certain point in time, the government's interests are going to run into themselves. So if you right. want to make it so that we're doing nothing but electric vehicles, well, all the stuff that comes out of the ring of fire is what you need for the batteries. Um, like we already see across the world, like supply chain issues around chips because there's not enough production. So the, in order to move forward on a lot of these things, you still need resources to do it. So it, like, it's in conflict. And I think that to Marcello's point, which is quite right, that you have to have an adult conversation about, okay, we want to do this, but in order to do that, we, want to do, we have to do this, and this is going to involve digging into the ground. And the Prime Minister is also on record as saying that no person would ever leave all this oil in the ground. So, um, yeah, he said that. In, he said that in 2012, and I'm not he sure. Said he, still he, said he said it. He said it. He said it in 2016 in Houston. I was there. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, it, I, I'm not. I still don't. Uh, I'm not sure he still holds to that idea. Anyway, we're out of time. So, thanks very much, and we'll speak to you again next week. Thanks. Bye, guys.